2 Chronicles today. Meet me in 2 Chronicles. Meet me in 2 Chronicles. When you find 2 Chronicles, you can go to chapter 20. When you find chapter 20, fix your eyes on verse 20 to 21. In the New King James Version, it reads in this manner. So they rose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of his holiness, as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy and yours forever. Father, this is your word. Before time, your word existed. Your word is not bound by time. This is why you say heaven and earth can pass away, but my words will never pass away. We exist because of your word, O oh Lord. When you stood on nothing and there was nothing, you spoke a word and declared, let there be. And there was no argument, there was. It's the power of your word. Your word convicts, your word transforms, your word regenerates, your word gives hope, your word gives light. And today we just want to hear nothing else but your word, O oh God. Speak through me, O oh God, as a vessel. Let me not dilute or add to my own, but let your word be pure for your people this morning. Father, as I say yes to this call to preach it, anoint my lips right now. Anoint my tongue, my mind, my heart. Anoint your hearers of your word to focus and pay attention to your word. Let their focus be on you, O God, as your word is spoken, that we may be moved from the inside out by your word. That as soon as I move from this pulpit, your word has done its work and never returned to you void. Father, we thank you this morning above all for your grace that has kept us. Your grace that has kept us even when we're unfaithful. Your grace has been so abundant for us. Your love is amazing. It is, we are not here because we deserve this time, but it is grace and grace alone. And we thank you, O oh God. We thank you. We thank you. Words can never express how we thank you, how much we are grateful. And with our lives this morning, we surrender and we say, have your way. Let your will be done in this place. Touch not just a few, but touch everyone by your word in the mighty name of Jesus. Release those who are imprisoned by your word, O oh God. Release those who are heartbroken by your word, O oh God. Release those who are going through challenges, O oh Lord. Set them free by your word in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you this morning. We adore you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Church, this morning, as I, as I pondered on the word, in fact, it is a word that has been in me from last week, even when I wrapped up the series we're dealing with. This is the word I, I, I wish to preach. In fact, there's words, not just this one, that God is investing in me. That there's someone in here or some people that need encouragement. There are people who need to know that God is still in control. There are people who need to put their trust in God. Whatever you are going through. Hence, the message today is titled just words that seem to say the same thing. 
And today I say stand firm or hold your position. Amen. In this world you will have troubles, Jesus said. Sadly, this was not a suggestion, but it was a guarantee. And we have come to learn that. We have come to learn the hard way that in life you will have troubles. You get over one trouble just when you are celebrating, something goes wrong. You can't even celebrate further because you are anticipating something to go wrong. You get a job and you're excited, but for a moment, because when you enter that place, you find a boss from hell. What you testify to be a blessing seems not to be a blessing. Because in this world, Jesus said, we will have troubles. We will go through troubles. That son who was a problem, they get saved. While you are celebrating of their salvation, something goes wrong. Because we are in a world that is filled with trouble. But I've come to learn that the tragedy of mankind when facing problems is not that we face problems, but it is because we cannot solve them as instant as we wish to. Whether you are rich or not, fact is there are some circumstances that are beyond our control. And that is the tragedy that we face because something happens and you just can't fix it as you want to. When your kids are wayward and out of control, you can't just fix it as you want it to. When your spouse wants to divorce you or your spouse is out of control, you can't fix him as you want to or fix her as you want it to. And this is a tragedy that we face, that we can't deal with pain as quick as we wish to deal with pain. When you lose a loved one, you can't deal with that pain as quick as you want to. Seven years later, you are still crying because of your mother who left. Ten years later, you are still crying because of your father who left. And that is the tragedy that we face, circumstances that are beyond our control. However, nothing pleases the heart than finding help in a time of need. Amen? When we are facing trying times and, unbear and, and, and unbearable circumstances, all we wish for or all we pray for is help to stand. I don't know about you, but help goes a very long way. A phone call that says, how are you, goes a very long way. A presence of someone who comes goes a very long way. Job's friends were the best of friends until they started to speak. Which goes to show that sometimes presence is enough. Because when they were quiet, Job was comforted. I don't know about you, church, but I've seen help get me out of a lot of things. When we are broke, we tend to loan sharks. Because we want help. You start getting loans because you want help. Some people, when they're stressed, they turn to alcohol. They turn to a lifestyle that is not good. It's a coping mechanism. It's because they want to ease the pain. You want help. All we do, we do because we are in pursuit of a way out. Church, my question this morning to you is when the odds are stacked up against you, who do you call? When everything seems to be going wrong, where is your place of refuge? When things are breaking, when you are trying to put them together, who do you call? 
You are too quiet. But I understand. Since you will not answer me, church, I saw it fit to go get Jehoshaphat today to come to the witness stand and let Jehoshaphat speak to us today. Let him testify of the God of the Lord today. Here is a man, Jehoshaphat, today who is giving witness of when the odds were stacked up against him. When you read in the same book, in chapter 17, verse 3, church, we read of a man who followed the ways of God. The Bible says about this man, he followed the ways of God like David, his father. They say this man relied and followed the Lord. But whether he followed the Lord, whether he was a good man, he was not immune from trouble. This man came to church every Sunday. This man came to Bible study Wednesday and Saturday. This man took care of God's work. But that did not save him from trouble. <laughs> because one way or another, trouble will come. Amen? When you continue to read about this man, the Bible says he was a very powerful man. And you must understand a king and power speaks of wealth in the time that we are in. Though he was a wealthy man, trouble still came his way. Can I say, church, that sometimes God allows trouble to come our way so that he can show who he is. Sometimes you run out of control and power because God wants to control the situation himself. Because if you were to do it yourself, you'd be prideful. But you have to be humble enough to know that this is God. Amen. 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 As I speak of this man, a powerful man, the power got into his head. He made an alliance with the king of Israel, that is Ahab. And Ahab is Jezebel's husband. He decided we're going to fight together, side by side. And they went to war. And they said, this is the attire you're going to wear. This is what I'm going to do. And they went to war. But guess what? The enemies did not go after Ahab. They went after him. When he saw the enemy, he called on the Lord. He says, Lord, save me. I'm dying. He repents. And God saves him in the face of death. When God saves him, eventually Ahab dies. Good riddance. Eventually, when God saves him, the man goes home and he meets a seer or a prophet who says, why did you make an alliance with the enemy of God? You see the dangers of power, church. Power can make you think you can make things work out. Now the man decides, I repent. The man truthfully repents. After repenting, it decides, I'm going to reform Judah. I'm going to bring things together. I'm going to restore worship. I'm going to restore the right way of God. I'm going to fix things the way they should be. But church, guess what? We read the first verses where we are. In the first verses, which is chapter, verse 1 and 2, after he reformed, his reformation is met by opposition. After you are faithful in the church, when you expect things to go your way, instead the devil opens up hell and sends his enemies, or sends rather his agents to you. When you thought, now I'm saved, I know Jesus, things are going to be going my way. And the devil says, <laughs> All hell breaks loose. The Bible says as soon as David was anointed king, the Philistines came immediately. Now I'm, I'm helping someone who thinks in salvation, troubles will be no more. 
troubles begin. <laughs> troubles begin. In verse 1, it says, It happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. The man just fixed his ways. The man just brought about order, but the Bible says after that, trouble came. Now, like any ordinary person, Church Jehoshaphat is still testifying. This is not my testimony, by the way. Like any normal person, Jehoshaphat was frightened. He was afraid. He was stressed. His anxiety levels were high. Hypertension was rising. If you read with me in verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared. I don't know if you can go to verse 3. If there, is there anyone at the back who can just take me to verse 3 quickly? Maybe they will think I'm reading my own Bible. Just verse 3. It, it says, I like this version. It says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid because troubles when they come you will react like a normal being but church you must finish it off Jehoshaphat knew who to call Amen. as I asked the question when you are going through troubles who do you call Jehoshaphat knew who to call the Bible says he set his face to seek the Lord. He did not set his face to call the pastor. He did not set his face to seek the people of the church. But his first place to go to was the Lord. When you are going through problems and trials, who do you call? Jehoshaphat says the right place to go to. He is to the Lord himself. Then the Bible says, and he proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek the Lord. He calls people after he has seeked the Lord. The reason your problems also prolong is because you call someone who does not help you but makes them more. Instead of calling God first. Who will even direct you who you need to call? You are quick to call your neighbor who after you hang up will gossip. Jehoshaphat said, I'm a king. What will people say if I'm afraid? But let me go to the Lord because he knows. The Bible says we don't have a high priest who does not sympathize with our weakness. Who was tempted as we were. Jehoshaphat sets his face and says, I know someone who knows better. I know someone who understands what I'm going through. And he says, he called the Lord. Amen. But what I love about God, he's not like man that he lies. He's not like the son of man to change his mind. If you, if you just go to verse 15 with me. In fact, let's start at, at verse 14. 14 is easier. God did not keep quiet. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zachariah, the son of uh, Benani, son of Jehiel, son of Matanai, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Church, God does not respond to Jehoshaphat directly, but he uses someone to respond. After the man had prayed, you will read his prayer, just read that chapter. Read the contents of the prayer. God doesn't respond to him directly like he did with David. He would respond to David. But with him, he touches someone in the assembly. In this case, he touches a Levite. 
on Sunday in our evening service, I said, if you are just attentive to what people say, sometimes you will find the will of God. I was speaking about Job's wife because she's the one who said, curse your God. That was cue for Job to know that actually I'm going through this test because someone wants me to curse God. But because you are not attentive, church, even when I speak from the pulpit, you are not attentive to catch what God is doing. You miss a lot. All we need to do is to listen. You choose the people you want to listen to. If you come to church and pastor is not preaching someone else, you will shut your ears. But all you need to do, church, is to just listen. Because God is saying something about you. God is saying something to you about your situation. Listen to what the man says. He, and he said, listen all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. <laughs> the battle is not yours, but God's. The tragedy we face is because we want to carry the battle ourselves. One man of God says you are carrying God weight. And God weight is not for human beings. You will not handle it. And this is why you are dying. All you need to do is give it all to the Lord. And today he's responding, church. He says the battle is not yours. Amen. He says the battle is not yours. But what should we do? Verse 16. He says, Tomorrow go down against them, and they will surely come up. So the fact that the battle is not yours does not mean you will not face it. Amen? I hope you caught that. The fact that the battle is not yours it does not mean you need not to face it. Because the prophet says, go up. Go up. And they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. But here's the nice thing. You will not need to fight this battle. But what must you do? My version says, position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Position yourself, church. Position yourself and stand firm. This is not the time to have weak knees. Position yourself and stand firm. I know you are going through a lot. I know you are facing a lot of challenges, but position yourself and stand firm. And see the salvation of the law. Not your salvation, but the salvation of the law that works on your behalf. My God. And see the salvation of the law. Who is with you? Now I understand why David said, He leads me. He leads me. He makes me. But he's with me in the wilderness. In the valley, he doesn't lead me. He is with me. Amen. Now I see why. Because this is the word. He says, I am with you in this battle. The only thing you need to do Stand firm and position yourself. 
What does position yourself mean, church? It means take up your stand. It means to station yourself. It means to present yourself. I know we are facing unbearable circumstances. We are, we are pressed on every side. We are overwhelmed. But it is time to take a stand. Amen. It is time to position ourselves. It is time to present ourselves and see the salvation of the Lord. The nice thing about you, church, you don't need to wonder about the salvation of the Lord. Because when you look at not just the cross, because the cross is empty, but when you go to the grave as well, the grave is empty. So you need not to wonder if salvation is there or not. You know salvation is there. You know that Jesus died. But after that day, he looked at death in the face. And he said, I will see you no more. And he went out. And he said, those who believe, they will declare the same to death. They will say, where is your sting, O death? They will get out of their graves and they will walk like Jesus. So you need not to worry about the salvation. Because you are sure that salvation is there. You know salvation is there. You are not like Jehoshaphat. You are not waiting to see it. You have salvation. It's in your hands. Because he has risen. He has risen. I said he has risen. Then we cannot stand and act as if he's not risen. We cannot allow ourselves to be ashamed. We cannot sit back and watch. We can stand and declare that he is risen. Amen? We know salvation. Our end is not distraction, church. Our end is salvation with the Lord. It is to be with him forever. It is to be with him forever. But now, pastor, you are telling us you are using Jehoshaphat. In fact, Jehoshaphat is speaking here with me. And you are telling us to stand firm and to hold our position. How do we do it? What should we do? Verse 20 then is very important to us. Because after he heard the words, this is what Jehoshaphat does, church. In my version it says, So they rose early in the morning and went to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Jemistin, and you inhabitants of Jemistin. Believe in the Lord your God. Hallelujah. Believe in the Lord your God. Stand firm, hold your position. How, Pastor? Point number one. We are breaking down the scripture now. Believe God. Believe God. It says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. This is the word he's bringing. He says, we must stand firm and not be shaken. But how do we do it? And believe in God. Believe in the word he spoke. Believe that he will come back. Believe that when you die, you sleep. Hallelujah. Believe in God. Amen. The problem of the church today is that we don't believe enough. We let problems choke our belief. But we must believe God. And we will be established. The word believe is synonymous with trust. Then we go to Solomon when he says, trust in the Lord. It's more or less what Joshua is saying. Lean not in your own understanding. Our understanding is so limited. Amen? Amen. The word believe speaks of support. It speaks of confirm. It speaks of faithfulness. But catch this, don't miss it. In this case, there is a word play which cannot be replic replicated in the language besides in Hebrew. Let me repeat that one. 
In this case, there is a word play which cannot be repeated or which cannot be put well in the English besides in the Hebrew. So the English does not do justice to what the text is saying, actually. McLaren continues, he says, Believe and be established are two varying forms of the same root. The closest, the closest we can get in the English should be in this way. Hold fast by the Lord your God, and you will be held fast. Amen. The English is killing the scriptures. I, that's why I, I, I laugh every time I read English and I realize it's killing. Because the word that was supposed to be used there for understanding sake, because it's a word play, is hold fast to the Lord and you will be held fast. Find support in the Lord and you will be supported. Catch this one as well. The importance of the statement is to show how we are kept not because we are holding on to the Lord, but because he's holding on to us. So as you cling to him, he clings even tighter. So what is keeping you is not that you are holding on to him, but it's that he is holding on to you. Church, I'm preaching good and you're too quiet. I thought you were tired of me teaching. I see you are not. I'll bring back my laptop, don't worry. <laughs> the point is, I hope you feel it. It's not that you are holding so tight to God. It's that God is holding on to you. I made this, this analogy and I'm making it again with the prodigal son. It's not that the prodigal son went home. It's that the father ran to him. This is why the origin of that story should be the love of the father, not the prodigal son. Because it seems as if the prodigal son is the superhero. But he's not. The superhero is the father. I will teach you one day what the father did to go there. The father made something that a, a man must not do. In the Hebrew culture, it is not right for a man to show his legs. When the father ran to the son, he left all of that out. And he showed his legs for the son. In the Hebrew culture, in that culture, when a rebellious son comes home, the community has a right to stone the child. This is why the father ran out so quickly before they could even find him. Do you understand all of that? Because had the father waited for the son to come to the gate, the son might have been killed. But the father said, I'm going to go low. I'm going to put myself to shame. I'm going to run for the son. I'm going to go so low. I'm going to become man when I am God. I'm going to take the fashion of man and be hungry and sleep and be tired and go through pain and be beaten and take all of that just for you. The reason you are standing, it's not that you are holding on to God. It's that he is holding tighter to you. Your grip cannot save you. Only he can save you. No matter how much you cling, it's not enough. You need a powerful hand to cling. And this is why he's holding on to us. This is why Jehoshaphat says, believe and you'll be established. Believe and you'll be established. Believe the words of the prophet and you will prosper. The word prosper there, again, it's not what you mean. It's not cars and nice, all these things. The word prosper means to push forward. It means to pull through. So when it says you will prosper, it means in the face of the people who think you are going down, you still move on. When people count you out, you still move on. When people say the show is over, you still move on. That is prosper. When doors are shut, you still move on. When people die by the wayside, you still move on. That is prosper. 
And this is what Jehoshaphat is saying. Believe the word that the pastor is speaking today because it's not his word. And you will prosper. You will face that challenge and you will prosper. You will prosper, but it all has this condition. Believe. Believe, church. I say believe. If there's a word I'm speaking today, I'm saying believe. It is high time we read and believe. Not read and think it is just a story. God says I don't change. God who said to Jehoshaphat, see the salvation, is still the same God today. He doesn't change at all. He doesn't change. Believe. 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 I move on to the second point, church. As you believe him, praise him. Let's read 21. It says, And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and to praise him. I don't want to mention that part, but I have to because it makes this to be important. In holy attire, praise him. The word praise means to shine. I don't know why the English went for praise. Because they should have said, to shine him. Because when something shines, it stands out. When something shines, you see it the most. When something shines, your attention goes to it. When you shine something, you are revealing something even better or bigger than what it normally should be. But they chose praise. Anyway, it's fine. Now you know praise means shine. And then to praise means to throw or to cast out. It means to revere or worship with extended hands. Church, the call to praise has a posture of surrender. You will not praise God fully if you are not surrendered. Because when you want to shine, you can't make him shine. Because two objects that shine, they are in friction. <laughs> so one must shine and the other must not. In this case, the Lord must shine. But capture this. Before you cast out or surrender your hands to show praise, surrender yourself. Your hands don't matter if you are not surrendered. Your hands do no justice if you are not surrendered. Your hands are vain if you are not surrendered. It says they wore holy attire because they are praising a holy God. Church, is your attire holy? Because holy attire can be worn by holy people. This is why your praises are hitting the ceiling. It's because your life is a mess. This is why your praise are noise to the Lord's ears. It's because you are filthy. This is why your praise is not changing your situation. It's because you are not in holy attire. This is why your praise won't go far. You are not in holy attire. This is why we need to be strict with the people who hold our mics every Sunday. Now you are too quiet. This is why we need to be strict with the people who hold our mics. I'm talking preachers, I'm talking singers. We do not need filthiness in this stage. Because we are just playing with words. We do not need dirt in this stage. We need holiness in this stage. Things won't go well. Things won't change if there's any filth in this stage. We need holy attire. We need holiness, church. Holiness is a must. Holiness is not a, a suggestion. It's a must. 
we praise God in holiness. We must be holy when we come before him and present our praises that they may be accepted. But if we are not holy, we are just using the instruments and the mics. I will not lead a church that does not pursue holiness. We must pursue holiness with everything in us. Holiness is a must. You cannot come and last night you were having the time of your life, drunkenness, smelling like alcohol and we give you that mic freely. We will not do that. You will not wake up from your boyfriend and come hold that mic. We will not play with that. We must be in holy attire because people's situations must change. Praises here must bring God to inhabit us. He says he inhabits the praises of his children. If we are not holy, he's not inhabiting this place. Then our praises are nothing. It's not just enough to believe, but we must praise him in a proper way. The singers, when they prepare to go out, Jehoshaphat says, this is your attire. I need to tell you, in, the, in those times, if you were not holy, you would have died for touching the holy attire. God is graceful. Repent. Holiness is important. Don't point fingers at God and say, God, you are allowing this to happen, but you are not holy. In, James, in John, I mean, it says, don't you know that God does not hear sinners? You don't know the scripture? You don't know it? He says, don't you know that God does not hear sinners? We cannot play church. People's lives matter. People's lives are at stake. There's a song that needs to change someone here. But that song won't change if we are filthy there. There's a someone that needs to change someone, but it won't change you if I'm filthy standing here. Holiness is a must. Amen. Amen. Let me continue. I'm closing. I'm closing. Now, this, the, the third point, I didn't know what to, to say to it, Mr. Shabala. I've never lost words for a point like this time. I said, we believe him. We praise him. Then I stopped and I said, I hear what your word is saying, God, but I can't translate it. And then it just says, praise him rightfully. So you believe him, you praise him, then you praise him rightfully. Your attitude of praise determines where your faith is. If you read with me the last part, which is the song I want to touch on, I didn't want to dwell much into the scripture. But the song says, give thanks to the Lord. For his steadfast love endures forever. Church, that song, it's not situation based. It is not challenges based. That song is God based. It is God based. They could have said, we, we, we are more, more than a conqueror through Christ. <laughs> My Lord. They could have sang that song. But they said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The right song to sing to the Lord is that. Give thanks to the Lord. Have they won yet? Have they seen the victory? They haven't, but they said, give thanks to the Lord. It's a song of faith. It's an utterance of faith. Their praise show where their faith is. Now, our faith, our songs, I mean, let me not get into it. Let me read my notes. As they gave thanks before victory, they consider his mercy, which speaks of how less they deserve the victory. Let me read that again, because I know you are a deserving generation. As they give thanks before the victory, they consider his mercy, which speaks of how less they deserve the victory. 
Can I be honest with you? What you are facing, you deserve. The challenges you face, you deserve. But what we don't deserve is God taking us out of it. Because we are sinful people. Never think you deserve to be taken out of a problem. The only thing you deserve, the only thing we deserve is death, is to die, is to suffer, is to struggle. But God in his rich mercy says, instead of punishing you, my child, I draw you to myself. Never think you can go to God and twist his arm and think you deserve to be taken out of the situation. This is why when he said to Paul, uh-uh, the thorn is good for you. Paul said, okay, Lord. But you, when God says the thorn is good for you, you say, what kind of a God are you? But God, is rich in mercy. Amen. God is rich in mercy. He says, draw to me. I will draw closer to you. He is rich in mercy. This is why we must praise him rightfully. Lift up his name in the midst of the situation and say, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and yours forever. You go to work and you meet the boss from hell. You greet him and you go your way and start to sing, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord for his good and his mercy and yours forever. You go through problems, tears on your eyes and you're going to bed, but you are declaring, praise the Lord for his good and his mercy and yours forever. This is the attitude that we must have, church. If we are to stand firm, this is the attitude we must have. If we are to position ourselves and hold on to our confession, this is the position that we need to have. This is the position. And I know my God is not a liar. He did say that you will prosper when you do that. Let me narrate the story and close it as I close. When you read the, the following verses, and when, and when they began to sing and praise the Lord, and they're doing all this, the Bible says, when they got to the battlefield, if you read your Bible, you're supposed to be shouting and clapping. But I can tell you, don't read your Bible. Let me tell you. When they got to the battlefield, they found that their enemies had killed themselves. What they went to go do when they thought they were going to fight was to go gather things and say, Lord, thank you. <laughs> Church, you were not there when he, went, when he went to the cross. You don't know the pain that he suffered there. You don't know the lash, the whipping, and everything that he took there. What you know is that you came to the battlefield and you were saved. How amazing is that? You didn't even have to lift a finger because your works were not going to be enough. When you came to the battlefield, you found that the devil was slain and out. <laughs> when you came to the place of death, you found that there's no name on the graveyard. It's empty. <laughs> and you asked yourself, so where am I going to be buried? And he says, you are not going to be buried. Your body will go there, but I have a place prepared for you. Imagine that. We are reading that of so-and-so, but so-and-so is not there. So-and-so is present with the Lord. You went to the battlefield to, to, to go gather evidence to say the Lord has won for me. Oh, my God. Church, God has done so much for us not to praise him. He has done so much for us not to praise him. As I opened, I opened with these words of Jesus when he says, In this world, 
you will have trouble. But I did not finish it off intentionally. Because when you finish it off, Jesus says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Take heart, for I have overcome. Do you understand then you are stressing about something that should not stress you? You are stressing about something that should not stress you. Your stress should be to preach. Because the rest of the things have been overcome. You are not sleeping at night because of something that is dead and overcome. Today I want you to sleep. I want you to sleep in peace. Know that the Lord is fighting on your behalf. I want you to look forward to singing praises in his house because you know the Lord is fighting on your behalf. I want you to wake up every morning and face the day because the Lord is fighting on your behalf. I don't want you to stress. If things don't go your way, look at them and move on. Amen. Lose your job if you have to, it's okay. But don't lose your position this morning. Amen. Don't lose your position, don't lose faith. Jesus says to Peter, let your faith not fail. And this is my word to you, church. May your faith not fail you. Whatever you are going through, I don't know it. I can't even begin to imagine how tough it is. But may your faith not fail you. May your faith keep you strong. May your faith uphold you. May your faith make you to stand. May your faith says there's tomorrow waiting for me. May your faith says I can overcome this. May your faith says I will prosper in the face of this. May your faith says this is not too much of a problem for my God. May your faith says I will not praise you trouble. I will praise God because we praise our trouble more than we praise God. May your faith keep you when you are falling. And when you get out of here and they ask you, who do you call in the midst of trouble? You say, I seek the Lord himself. You say, salvation is in no any other but in him and him alone. When they say, but don't you have a pastor? You said, my pastor will see me through, but I'm calling God. I'm calling him the author and finisher of my faith. Amen. Amen. Church, let us believe in God. Let us praise him with holy attires. Praise him rightfully. The sufferings of this present age are nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us. Amen. Stand on your feet, church. I want us to pray. I'm done. I'm done. If you can stand, stand. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to, I want us to get it right. I want us to get it right. Now, I normally don't do this, but, but I'm going to do it today. You don't have to come up in front where you are. You just lift up your hands as I pray. I'm praying for you. I'm going to intercede for you. My hands are also lifted because I need your intercession. And we are just going to go to the Lord. I'm going to pray that may he strengthen us. In Isaiah, he says, when we tire, he will renew our strength and will mount up on high as on eagle's wings. Now, I want you to believe that because that word says he knows that you will get tired. But he says, I will carry you nonetheless. May the Lord who started the good work in you see through to completion. Now, I have this guarantee as well. In Jude, he says, now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling. And I'm sure that when you cling to him, he will keep you from stumbling.
Just keep your hand raised and praying. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you. You never speak your word in vain. Your word is true. Your word is seasonal. Your word knows the heart of the people. Though I may prepare, but you know the heart better than me, O oh God. Now I pray, O oh God, meet your people at the point of their need. Those who are going through circumstances, who are going through trouble, and they just need you. Lord, I pray that you show up for them. As they believe in you, establish them, O oh God. As they hold on to you, hold them, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. For we know in your hand we are safer. Your hand, O oh God, your hand, your hand is better than the hand of men. You will never let us slip out of your hand, O oh God. You will keep us. You will wipe the tears of those who cry, O oh God. You will give us joy and you give us peace that surpasses all understanding. That we may stand and declare your greatness. Praise the beauty of your holiness, O oh God. Father, I pray that you touch each and every one whose hands are lifted up and who need you. Strengthen them, O oh God. May your word be strength alone. May your word, your word alone, O oh God, be our place of refuge. It says the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and they are safe. Here are your righteous people whose hands are lifted up. They run to you for safety, Lord. And we thank you that, Lord, safety is what we have because of the sacrifice of the cross. That, Lord, you saved wretched people like us, sinners as we are, but you thought of us and you saved us, O oh God. You took us from every background, every place, O oh God, and you saved us. Now we have being in you, as Paul says, in you we live, we move, and we have our being. Lord, you saved us, and we thank you for salvation. We thank you for salvation, which is our hope of assurance, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word which you spoke out of this place. May it serve its purpose in the lives of your people. May it resonate with them, O oh God, in this time. May it uplift them, O oh God. May you, O oh God, show yourself even more throughout the week in their lives, O oh God. As they remain faithful unto you, remain faithful to them in the mighty name of Jesus. Even as a church, we vow, O oh God, that our lips will be clean as we praise you. That with holy attires we will worship your name. We will adore your name as we say holy to you, as we say you are worthy. It will come from clean lips, O oh God, in the mighty name of you. For we know... You delight in obedience more than sacrifice, O oh God. And our obedience, O oh God, we shall give to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word in the name of Jesus. If you are next to someone, just hug that person. Pray over someone who's next to you. Begin to just embrace one another, church. It's just in my spirit that you embrace one another. Avail yourself to your brother and your sister. Just if you hold hands, hold hands, whatever you do, if you are next to someone, just pray for that person. Just pray for that person. And if you are listening to me and you are not sure that you are saved, pray also. The pray. The Bible says you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart and you shall be saved. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray. Father, we pray. Father, we pray. Begin to heal your people. Begin to heal your children, O oh God. Begin to heal your children who need you this day, who need you, O oh God. Begin to heal us, O oh God. Begin to touch our lives. Transform us, O oh God. Strengthen our faith, O oh God. May it not fail us, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. May our faith not fail us in the name of Jesus Christ. Worthy are you, worthy are you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, you are wonderful. Oh, Father, you are great. Oh, Father, you are great. In the mighty name of Jesus, make us one, O oh God. Make us one as a church. Make us one, O oh God. Make us one. In the mighty name of Jesus.